So I'm with uh, John Hancock, uh, the former professor at DAP, and uh, I'm just going to ask you a couple questions for the interview. And uh, when did you come to UC, and what brought you here? Um, I started teaching in the architecture school here in 1978, mm. so that's 41 years ago. <laughs> and um, I saw an ad for the position as I was finishing up my graduate degree, and. It was for somebody to come and teach architectural history and design. Mm. And I said, well, that looks like a job I would enjoy. And uh, I was familiar with Cincinnati because I had relatives who lived in this area. Mm. And I uh, really liked the city. So it seemed like a good match. And so I interviewed and they hired me and I've been here ever since. Okay. And I guess you could say the interviewing process was pretty simple. No, interviews for oh. jobs are never simple. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty competitive field, so um, and there's a committee, and they're going on. They're going on your references. Sometimes you know who the references are, and sometimes you don't. And you have to give a speech in front of faculty and students, and they take you out to dinner, and you know all this kind of stuff. So no, it wasn't simple, but. It was a good match. It was a good match there, so they hired me. And uh, what are you most passionate about? Uh, me, me now? Uh, general. <laughs> uh. Well, the thing about being here for 41 years is that uh, I've gone through a lot of projects and a lot of phases and a lot of, even, you know, might even say a lot of different careers while I've been here and different kinds of roles. So I guess I've been passionate about a number of different things <laughs> over, the, over that amount of time. Um, I suppose for the last half of that period, uh, my main passion has been on the uh, ancient earthworks of Ohio and uh, doing public uh, education exhibits and documentaries and stuff about those. So it's just kind of a spin-off from my architectural history background. Uh, but once I discovered that we have these fascinating Indian monuments and ruins here in Ohio, I became pretty thrilled with that. And, and, uh, and uh, so I spent a lot of time on that. And I'm still working on that because I'm part of a group that's preparing the World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage nomination for these sites now. So. And what is the ancient uh, earthworks of Ohio? Uh, well, uh, there's uh, dozens and dozens of uh, significant uh, earthwork monuments uh, in the southern half and central part of Ohio. Mm -hmm. They were built by a culture about 1800 years ago called the Hopewell culture. That's what it's called today. And uh, they're pretty amazing and pretty fascinating. They're huge. Uh, many of them are precisely geometric precise geometric figures and uh, many of them are aligned to perfect astronomical you know sort of like Stonehenge only even more accurate uh, and they were made by Indians you know almost 2,000 years ago oh, wow. here in Ohio so it's, a, it's an amazing story it startles a lot of people who hear about it for the first time mm -hmm. uh, and the architecture of these places is is um, let's just say unusual. It's a little hard to perceive it sometimes, uh, partly because they're so big. Some of them are uh, sort of worn down by decades of agriculture. It's a little hard to see, a little hard to understand. So that's why I enjoy getting involved in doing educational media about these places because it was a challenge. And I guess you volunteer for, for the Volunteer for the uh, uh, Earthworks? It's a volunteer position now, yes, to okay. serve on this committee that's putting the nomination together. Okay. Oh, wow. That sounds cool. But it's something to do in retirement. You know? <laughs> I can keep keep doing my professional work to some extent in retirement, and that's hmm. uh, you know just enough, but not too much. Mm -hmm. It's just it's, it's, it's good. Good good work balance. I'm glad I'm not just working in the garden. <laughs> I never did play golf, so that's not going to work for me. <laughs> Um, uh, why did you want to teach at UC? Why did I want to teach? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think what attracted me here was 
Initially, it was that this was a good fit for my interests. Uh, at the time, in 1978, there was a lot of interest in the field of architecture in historical awareness and that design students, architectural design students, should know history and they should know it well and they should know how to interpret and how to you know, base their works in principles that are rooted in the historical tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this was exactly my graduate thesis topic. So, mm -hmm. and the director of the school at the time was fascinated by this question. He wanted to steer the school, the curriculum, in a little new, a little bit of a new direction mm -hmm. uh, that that would take more of that into account. And so, you know, hiring me was one of his. You know, one of his sort of agenda things for the school, mm -hmm. and uh, so it was a really good match. It was, it was an opportunity to to do some uh, do some really intriguing things, you know, uh, pedagogically and with with uh, coursework and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a uh, sort of tailor made opportunity for me. I felt very lucky because a lot of people in the field who just get out of graduate school they have to move two or three times before they find. Mm -hmm you know, a school that they really kind of click with. But mm -hmm. I was here and, uh, and, uh, and matched what they wanted to do with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to have a lot of uh, creative input like right away. Um, again, I, like I said, I knew the city and I liked it. I liked Cincinnati. I thought it was a very beautiful city with a lot of potential. <laughs> Uh, well, not all that potential had been realized yet in the late 70s, <laughs> but it was, it was, you know, it was, uh, it was a good place. So, uh, that's what attracted me here initially, and then as I got into teaching for a few years, I realized the students who come here in the architecture program and in town are really amazing. Mm. It's, as you may know, it's a very, very competitive program, and so the quality of the students is very high. Mm -hmm. uh, the um, co-op program means that they learn a lot of their technical stuff outside the school, so we can have more fun with theoretical stuff inside the school, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I love that, as most of my colleagues do, and uh, so it was a really good place to kind of settle in and and, uh, and grow. So you, you felt like it was a per perfect match for you? Uh, yeah, I don't, I couldn't think of anything really that, you know, how it could have been better in some ways, so. Awesome. And then I had different opportunities along the way, so eventually I started teaching graduate programs, and then I ran a graduate program for a while. I was an associate dean for a while hmm. for graduate studies and research, so that was that was pretty interesting too. And then I got a lot of external grant work to do the Earthworks stuff. Mm -hmm. So I became a sort of a grant writer and a museum exhibit designer. And it was all kinds of fun stuff that we got to do eventually. Uh, what kind of museums did you uh, design? We, uh, working with uh, teams of students, we designed the uh, exhibit space at the Hopewell Culture National Historical Park in Chillicothe. Mm -hmm. Wow. You can still go there and you can still see our work. Uh, we designed the physical exhibit space uh, and then we did a multimedia program hmm. uh, as well that featured the uh, earthworks. We did computer model reconstructions of the earthworks. Hmm. That was kind of the basis for our, um, our projects that we did uh, on the Hopewell sites. And then we did interactive video exhibits. In that case, we did the physical space around it as well. Uh, and then we got a big grant from the NEH, the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, to do a traveling exhibit about more of the sites. Oh, wow. Uh, and then that, uh, that was also a physical design, about a 500 square foot uh, exhibit that could be dismounted and moved from one setting to another. Uh, and we also designed that initially with the input of a studio, a DAP studio, and um, I had it fabricated, collaborating with the Cincinnati Museum Center people, they did the fabrication, mm -hmm. and they managed the travel, so it went to, I don't know, probably 25 different sites around the country. Oh, wow. Uh, 
and then it has now been permanently installed in the Ohio History Connections uh, Museum in Columbus. Okay. The Ohio History Center. Oh, okay. Which you probably know well. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> and the, uh, the archaeology exhibit, the sort of centerpiece, is this thing that we did back in the early okay. 2000s. Okay. And what was the graduate program that, that you helped run? Uh, I started uh, directing the Master of Science in Architecture program in the late 80s mm -hmm. and managed it through most of the 90s. Uh, and then a little bit later, the school started a Master of Architecture. That's a program for professional architecture students. Mm -hmm. The previous one has been was called a post-professional program. It's for architects who are already licensed or licensable to do an academic study, okay. like history or theory or something. So that's the one I ran initially, and then was, was involved in the MARC program, the professional program after that. Mm -hmm. And what was the MARC program? Was it you said it was a professional program? It's for, it's a graduate degree for um, architects. Okay. For people who are going to go and practice. Okay. And we set that one up as a, as a, as a response to the, uh, the sort of trending in the field is that the professional degree that you, most people expect now for architects is the masters. Okay. It was the, when I started it was the bachelors. Mm -hmm. And that's what UC was teaching back in the 70s and, and 80s. Okay. So we developed the masters, and now that's what most of our students okay. complete that degree. And uh, that, speaking of like UC uh, architecture, did you have any part of uh, help building UC's architecture? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> the person who made it all happen uh, was Dean J. Chatterjee. We just interviewed him oh, not too long ago. All right. Um, well, there was one point, before it all started, he had been dean, I don't think he'd been dean very long, he called me up, I think it was before email, and he said, John, can you give me a list of, uh, you know, 10 or 12 of the best known architects in the world right now? And I, I was teaching a, a course at the time called Architecture Since 1966. Hmm. Okay, and this was around 1982, so there was only about 14 years worth of material in this syllabus, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, you know, I had some expertise on that, and, and so he asked me for this list, and I sent it to him. And it had names on it, like, oh, Peter Eisenman, Michael Graves, Aldo Rossi, I don't know, if they, we weren't studying Frank Gehry yet, uh, but, you know, Guathme and I.M. Pei, you know, these people. Mm -hmm. who were in my course. Uh, and then I never, you know, I, there wasn't any follow-up. I just sent on the list. Uh, but then later on, <laughs> of course, you know what happened. Uh, he persuaded uh, President Steger uh, to proceed with the, the Signature Architect program. So whether my list had anything to do with that, I have no idea. But <laughs> So that's why I have to answer your question. I don't really know. Oh, because so. after that, no, I mean, they were they were running, and I wasn't involved in anything after that. Okay. Oh, wow. So I had no official role in it. Mm. I just don't know whether that list was the beginning of <laughs> Jay Chatterjee's research on the question of who to call, <laughs> <laughs> which he started doing, you know, right away, practically. So. Mm -hmm. so you never had any role of, like, actually designing the buildings, did you? No, uh-uh. Mm. No. Oh. We spent a lot of time interpreting the buildings in my mm. graduate theory seminars later on. Really? Because, you know, especially our building, especially the that building, is, mm -hmm. was very uh, controversial, let's say. People had strong opinions about it. And so we would always, as a discussion topic in seminar, we would consider those points of view and sort of pick them apart and try to compare them and try to... You say, well, you know, from what point of view is this person deriving this opinion? And so that's what we do in okay. architecture, history, and theory. So it was a very fun uh, uh, sort of case study to think about. Okay. And we were living in it at the time too, so we could have we had a different 
we could encourage students to have a different understanding based on how they were sort of living in it, mm. not just being sort of an aloof critic, but what does it mean to actually live in it? How does that affect your perception? So anyway, a lot of fascinating questions around interpreting these buildings, yeah. Okay, and how, how did you interpret uh, some of the buildings that you see? Uh, like McMicken, for example, I know it's one of the oldest buildings. The original one, or yeah. the one that gets, uh, oh, I guess, yeah, they haven't added to that one. I was thinking of the tangible. <laughs> How do we interpret McMicken? Well, yeah. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a historical period piece. I think it was, you know, 30s, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, that's when universities wanted to try to make a connection with a, a certain slice of American heritage, right, sort of the colonial... Williamsburg-y kind of stuff, and uh, so that's what they did. And you know, most buildings up until the 30s were trying to establish their cultural meaning through a, which historical style they pick, you know, whether it's Greco-Roman or Gothic or what have you. So that's just was part of that. Okay. Part of that tradition. Okay. And which uh, style did you like more, uh, Greco? Um, and from the historical style? Yeah. yeah. Well, just talking about college buildings, mm -hmm. um, I remember visiting uh, Yale and Princeton and and thinking that uh, the uh, what we called it collegiate Gothic. Mm. It's based mostly on a British uh, medieval style mm -hmm. uh, for the residence halls, you know, like an old manor house or a courtyard with yeah. courtyard plans and. So far, I always thought those were particularly beautiful, mm. charming, as that they were supposed to be, and intimate and domestic, uh, but they're really very beautiful. And how we don't have much of that here, mm -hmm. if any, but really. Um, but you know, as a as an architectural educator, that was sort of that sort of back there. I mean, we don't we don't never really have taught. Mm -hmm. uh, the styles, okay. other than this is history, you know, mm -hmm. we don't do them anymore. And how would you describe uh, UC's changes as far as like campus buildings? Spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even more than the buildings is the, the master plan, the landscaping, mm -hmm. and the way it's all been tied together. Mm -hmm. When I came here in 78, uh, this was the most, really the ugliest and the most confusing uh, and the uh, most depressing campus to try to walk around on. Oh. Um, I mean, there were some buildings that were okay, you know, McMicken's okay. And the old DAP building, the original DAP building, the sort of nice modern Bauhaus looking thing was, was okay. It wasn't air conditioned, but it, you know, I didn't mind the look of it. Uh, and a few others, but I remember trying to walk across campus to try to get somewhere. And if you tried to go any further than Tangeman, it was just impossible. You, you get lost. Um, you try to cut through Teachers College or something, and it was just, I remember it's just horrible experiences trying to, trying to walk across. It was so disorienting and so ugly. There were these brick buildings that sat out there in front of Tangeman. They were old, I don't know what they were originally, but I think they were like chemistry labs or something. Mm -hmm. They were just derelict and the spaces between the buildings were depressing. It was bad. So it went from being like the worst campus I'd ever seen in my life, physically, architecturally, in terms of being beautiful to, you know, one of the best in the world, right? mm -hmm. And what's significant about that, I think, at least for, you know, with my architect hat on, what's significant about that is they did not do it in the way that Miami did it, mm -hmm. does it. I mean, that's an attractive campus too, in a way, but they do it by just saying everything has to be perfect brick and white Georgian, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, so we did it in a much, much, much more sophisticated way by having really interesting contemporary buildings by really talented designers, and all of them are good in their own way, um, even DAP.
No, I like, I like our building. Um, um, and then to bring in Hargreaves and his team for the landscape plan and to weave it all together mm -hmm. and it, at the same time make allusions to Ohio and its earthworks, you know, and uh, the old waterways that used to course through this landscape and stuff. I mean, it's absolutely brilliant. So, from the worst to the best. So, a transformation like almost beyond belief. It's so good. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't have any part of it. You just you we just watched. You just, you just watched. talked about it in our class <laughs> classrooms. <laughs> Do you wish you had part of it? Like no. some same? No, uh -uh. no, no. No. You just wait. You kind of like left that to the higher ups and J. Chatterjee. Well, in a way, I mean they're they're responsible. They're they're, they're the patrons. Okay, mm -hmm. the university is the uh, is the patron. And, it's always been the case that great architecture has its patrons. Mm -hmm. And the patron has to be the client, of course. The patron is the, you know, what you call Lorenzo de' Medici, you know, he's a patron. But it's sort of the same thing, you know. Mm -hmm. Patrons uh, who are savvy about design mm -hmm. want to hire the people who are going to do the most brilliant designs because then they get the glory too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Lorenzo understood that perfectly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I think that's what happened. I hope that this is corroborates what what Jay said. Uh, I think that's what happened. He persuaded Steger and the board of trustees that this would be good for you, see, mm -hmm. which it was. Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry about my phone. My phone. <laughs> You're fine. I won't worry about it. <laughs> and um, so no, I didn't. No, I. I didn't wish that I was, you know, helping to design the buildings or anything like that because it was like, no, we gotta, we gotta take this to another level. I'm mm -hmm. sure we're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a few of my colleagues were sort of disgruntled, and you know, some people said, well, you know, you got a bunch of supposedly good architects on your faculty here. Why aren't they designing the campus? And some of them might have felt that, mm -hmm. but. I, I was, as a historian, I guess I had this perspective that, you know, if you really want to rise to the top on the international stage, mm -hmm. it couldn't just be our faculty doing these buildings. Yeah. So. And uh, what did you hope students take away from your class? Uh, well, I taught a lot of different classes over the uh, years, so <laughs> the first class that I developed and taught was a history of Western architecture. Mm -hmm. so I taught that for 15 years. And what I wanted them to take away from that was the feeling that uh, the traditions of the architectural past uh, are something that they are inheriting as professionals and they should have a mature and responsible attitude towards their own histories. Mm -hmm. Which means that no, they're not going to go out and do Gothic buildings. Mm -hmm. They're not even going to go out and do classical building, although there's a little slice of practice that does that. But there's not going to be that. But that they should respect these these traditions and they should understand principles that will help them do better work if they're paying attention to the buildings from the past. So mm. that's what I wanted them to get out of it. Okay. And uh, what about your graduate program? In my graduate seminar, uh, it's that I still have been teaching recently. Um, it's based in a, a branch of philosophy called phenomenology, hmm. and it's not terribly far away from that same point, hmm. which is that um, our experience of the world, our experience of the environment, depends on our having uh, a memory, mm -hmm. shared memory, uh, an understanding of the meanings that are embedded in our experience up to right now. And if we're going to talk about how we're experiencing this building, um, we need to kind of go down into the roots of that, mm -hmm. of that understanding okay. of our, our um, our cultural memories, our human memories, our even our sort of biological memories are affecting how we understand the effects of light, for example. Mm. 
uh, space, enclosure, and so forth. Okay. So it's almost like a kind of like a philosophy class, but more. Yeah, we read uh, we read philosophy. We read this guy named Martin Heidegger, who's pretty tough to read, but um, architects have been reading him for forty years now, mm. and um, so I have some ideas about how we should be reading it a little bit differently and a little bit better, and uh, so that's what I teach. Oh, nice. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. And. Um, what were relationships um, like among your colleagues at, at your time at UC? Uh, generally, generally good. Uh, did you always have someone that you can always go to for advice or for help? Yeah. Yeah, either the school director, uh, who, you know, in the sort of first half of my career, uh, they were sort of the default mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, but there were other faculty as well that, that would help you out or help you get published somewhere or something, answer questions about the bureaucracy or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. right, so I've always felt like I had what I needed that way. Mm -hmm. But then the second half of my career, I kind of became that to others. So oh. that was, especially as associate dean, you know, mm -hmm. that's your job is to help people with their projects. So mm -hmm. that was good. Cool. And, um, how did UC respond to your needs, um, like research-wise, grants, money? Uh, well, I saw a lot of transformation in that area, too, over mm -hmm. the years. Like the campus transformed from ugly to fascinating, wonderful. Uh, from my perspective, and I don't have the maybe the best perspective on it, but from my perspective, the university's understanding of how to manage, how to help research and how to help uh, with graduate studies, mm -hmm. graduate programs, also improved a lot during mm -hmm. that time. Uh, it seemed. It could have been my own uh, inexperience and naivete, but I think in, in the early years when I was trying to run a graduate program, it mm -hmm. seemed like there wasn't much help, there wasn't much support. Uh, and it was kind of a closed black box, if anything, about how you're supposed to ask for resources or share experiences with other, you know, colleagues trying to do the same thing and so forth. It was just hit or miss. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not going to mention any names about who was in charge in those days, but, um, and it was also true in DAP uh, that it had, it was mostly focused on undergraduate mm -hmm. education. I mean, all the big programs, most all the big programs, except for planning maybe, were bachelor's degrees. Oh. And so the little, the little master's degrees that, like the one I was trying to run were, again, we were sort of on our own. Mm -hmm. In that too, there was a lot of. Um, it was hard for many of our colleagues to understand what graduate education needed mm -hmm. or needed to be. And when we trans, when we uh, started up the M Art program, there was a long learning curve about how to do that, mm -hmm. what that should be like, what kind of resources it needed. Yeah, and so forth. Uh, but by the, by the time I retired, uh, in the last uh, you know number of years before that, mm -hmm. uh, I thought things had improved a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember during my last years as a graduate program director and associate dean, I think we were working with Neville Pinto, who, uh, who was then the dean at the graduate school. Oh. And... Uh, um, things were working a lot better, I thought. Mm -hmm. Again, it could have been just that I had figured out a lot of stuff by then and been through a lot of struggles. Uh, but I think there was a better understanding at the university level and a better understanding in DAP mm -hmm. about graduate, graduate education and, and research. Okay. Oh, wow. Mm. So I would put that right alongside the campus transformation as something that I witnessed over those 40 years.
And did you witness a uh, Sander uh, implosion? Uh, I was with a group of students in Greece at the time. Oh, really? <laughs> so we watched it on TV. <laughs> Reruns of it or something. I forget how we got to see that because I don't know if it was was the internet around then. I don't even remember now. But um, I just saw the video of it. Mm -hmm. Do you wish you were there? No, not really. <laughs> I was kind of glad to see it go. But. Uh, what were your thoughts on the building? Uh. It was a period piece from the 60s, mm -hmm. and uh, most of those are really not that great. Mm. <laughs> it was just there. Yeah. And um, has like the history of Cincinnati, its history have an effect on UC's architecture? on the campus? Mm. Mm, I'm not sure what you mean. That's, that's kind of vague, I guess. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I, don't know. I don't know what you said. Um, well, like, Cincinnati's, like, city history, did some of it kind of, like, influence the, uh, the design of the buildings? Buildings well, on campus? Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't think of anything very specific. Mm. Um, in general, I would just say that the buildings that were built on campus were a response to the stylistic uh, uh, preferences of the time in consideration mm. of the sp of the building type. Mm -hmm. Right, which is yeah. all. I mean, all through most of the 19th century and into the 20th. That's how. Okay. That's how architecture happened. Yeah. The architect and the client would more or less agree that yeah, this ought to be a classical building because 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 mm -hmm. uh, some precedent somewhere, uh, or because it symbolizes the right thing for this kind of institution. Mm -hmm. You know, blah blah. So that's, and yeah, that's still what was going on when they built the DAP building, oh. right? Because mm -hmm. they built that in their early 50s, I think, and what's the most important modern design school in the world that you want to reference in the 50s? You want to reference the Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. So that's why it looks like Bauhaus. They made it out of brick. I guess that may have a little bit to do with Cincinnati, but yeah, not probably. Okay. Brick is a lot more than just Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> it's one to warm it up a little bit, probably. Okay. But basically they built a Bauhaus on top of that hill and mm. that was the right way to say this is a cool design school mm. at the time. Okay. And uh, how have students changed over time when you were at UC? Mm. Well, I think there have been several phases. Uh, Initially, I was really impressed with the students. I think we were coming out of the 60s and 70s culture and they were very... Uh, they were culturally engaged, they were idealistic, they were progressive-minded, they wanted to get out and improve the world, and they wanted to understand how architecture could do that. Um, and like I said, they were very smart, and um, so that was good for a while. And then, as we started getting into the 80s, uh, and this is a broad general culture thing too, when I got into the 80s, it seemed like they were more interested in uh, getting out, you know, getting a job, making a lot of money, buying a BMW, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, so that was another phase. Uh, and then the next transformation I remember after that, in the 90s, late 90s, by the late 90s, I remember teaching a, a, a research uh, uh, class where the students are supposed to be formulating their thesis project mm -hmm. and so we're having discussions about topics and ideas and so forth and this one woman uh, a woman from the, in the class um, was making a contribution to the discussion and she said well during my co-op in Venice I was you know and blah 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 she talked about something and I suddenly realized Wow, these students have been having some amazing experiences that they didn't have when I started here. Mm -hmm. The idea of an international co-op 
was, you know, just nobody was doing it in mm -hmm. the 70s and 80s. And, you know, by the last decade of my teaching, everybody, you know, at least the top half of the students in terms of talent were co-oping in, you know, Shanghai and Singapore and Paris and London and Barcelona and Venice and, you know, Milan and uh, their cosmopolitan knowledge had just exploded, just incredibly. Mm -hmm. So that was the next transformation I saw in, in students. Did you like that, uh, that type, or that, that period where uh, students was able to experience more things outside of UC and were able to bring back their oh, yeah. experiences? Yeah, they became UC. much more sophisticated human beings and designers hmm. because of that. Hmm. And uh, what changes did you witness at UC besides like the uh, architecture? Uh, portion. Well, I think uh, uh, hmm. there was the the growth of the uh, re graduate and research culture that I talked about before. Um, the administrative infrastructure grew a lot, hmm. and you know it's. There's a kind of negative spin that can be put on that, administrative bloat, you know. And I'm going to try to stay neutral about it because, you know, I do regret that as a percentage, as a percentage of the university budget that goes to hiring research and teaching faculty, you know, that's gone down quite a bit. Mm. And the percent that's going to pay administrators has gone up quite a bit. So that... You know, that sounds like a negative, and maybe it is. Um, but let me give you an example mm -hmm. of what all of these people are for, and maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> uh, back in 1983, I'd only been here about four years, uh, I decided I wanted to do a, a international study program. Mm -hmm. That I was going to get together a, a group of uh, architecture students and we were going to go to London for a quarter, mm -hmm. academic quarter, do it in London. I would teach the classes, they would live in the city, um, and so forth. And uh, so I just went to the office of the college business manager and said, here are the numbers, here's what it's going to cost. Um, and I'm going to invite all these students who want to go. When they sign up, they pay an extra fee, and we go. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. Then I took the money and I deposited it in a British bank, and we did the program, and everything went fine, and we came home again. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to do that, there's a lot of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to use the word bureaucracy because that sounds negative. But there's a lot of infrastructure to help you do that mm -hmm. and to make sure that all the liability issues are covered, to make sure that, you know, every little aspect of it is under control, mm -hmm. right? And there's a university office, sort of, I don't know what the vice provost or something, there's somebody running that. Uh, so now in order to do that, you need to work with these people and they help you. Right, so I'm going to try to say, you know, it's good both ways. Mm -hmm. And in the current climate, legal climate and so forth, I'm certain that this is necessary. Mm -hmm. But that's how UC has changed. Okay. okay. That's one of the ways that UC has changed. Probably every university has changed in the same way. And in many, many other, not just for international programs, mm -hmm. but in many, many other areas, the same kind of growth of a administrative support structure or monitoring structure or review structure or whatever, mm -hmm. what have you, um, that has grown much larger. I guess you could say the more students that come into university, the bigger the administration has to become to like handle. Yeah, that could be, although I know if you looked at the proportions, whether it would have grown even more than the proportion of students. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. but. 
I think the ratio of faculty to administrators at the, at the administrator level has grown a lot. Okay. Full time faculty, anyway. <laughs> Anyway, but anyway, I want to be clear. I'm not complaining about that. Yeah. I'm not an expert on w w whether that was necessary, mm -hmm. uh, but probably um, I'm sure it was to some extent. Okay. And how have uh, UC's priorities shifted since you started at UC? Priorities. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a quip that maybe you're going to hear from somebody else too. Uh, that the University of Cincinnati, uh, by the way, I came when it, it was just a year or two out of being a city mm -hmm. university. Uh, a little, you know, I can't imagine it now, <laughs> being funded by the city <laughs> or subsidized or whatever it was. I don't know what it was. But anyway, uh, the quip is this, that uh, the university has gone from being a uh, state-supported university mm -hmm. to being a state-assisted university to being a state-located university. Mm. Dang. Did you follow that? Yeah. Thank the you. support is gone. <laughs> or nearly gone. It's shriveled up to the level of being assistance. Mm. It's not gone, but it's way down. Mm. The state support is way down. Tuition is way up. And uh, administrative costs are way up. So this is, this is, I think, I mean, I forgot what the original question oh, was. Oh, how about, how about UC's priorities Priorities shifted. have shifted. Yeah. So uh, this has in some ways been forced upon the university because mm -hmm. of cuts from our um, beloved legislators. Um, so the priorities have shifted to raising money, mm -hmm. growing the endowment, getting private donors, uh, naming programs and buildings and so forth uh, 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 after multi-million dollar donor. So yeah, the job description of provost, the job description of deans, uh, the job description even of program directors is number one, raise money. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a priority that in 78, I don't think we were worrying about that. Mm -hmm. We were worrying about academics. Just later, just later, uh, and you know, when you're at UC, you're instead of teaching, you're just more focused on like you know, trying to raise money for your program. And and did it did it distract you anyway? Or well, I got interested in writing grants. I mean, there was some there was some motivation to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, folks would say, well, you know, we need to get the research dollars up, mm -hmm. and of course. Medicine and engineering are really what's driving the, the research dollars to the university. But I was interested, I took it as a challenge to raise money in the humanities, mm -hmm. arts and humanities. And I said, sure, why not? I can do this. Mm -hmm. Especially when I discovered these earthworks mm -hmm. and said, aha, uh -huh, this is a public, this is a question of some public interest and importance. Uh, probably, the, uh, probably the NEH would be interested in this, and they were. Mm -hmm. I got a whole string of grants from the NEH totaling about $900,000 oh, wow. to do these earthwork projects from the very early experiments all the way through to this big traveling exhibit. And then we did a website after that, a tourism website about the earthworks called the Ancient Ohio Trail. Mm. Those were all NEH funded. So I wouldn't want to say that there was pressure to do external funding, but there sort of was, at least from you know some quarters mm -hmm. um, to get the external funding up because mm -hmm. grants they don't only not only pay for your project but they provide money for the infrastructure the, the administrative infrastructure mm -hmm. <laughs> that he was talking about mm -hmm. and and so and it, it, it trickles down to, to students I mean we were able to teach some extra classes because of it and mm -hmm. so on so it does have an academic impact too okay let's see um how, how have you seen UC connected, like the city of Cincinnati? Uh, well, uh, in urban planning, there's been the, the Niehoff studio. I think that's kind of a big one. And since then, I just remember reading about 
broader initiatives, but I haven't been involved in them. But mm. I, um, I think that's one of President Pinto's uh, interests, and it was uh, also of uh, President um, Ono, I think, before that. Mm -hmm. So, as far as I know, you know, it's happening. I'm not in on it, <laughs> not it, not following it. But. Yeah. Um, do you do you like the connection with UC and the city? Sure. Sure. It's an urban university. I think trying to live up to that name is, is uh, significant. Okay. We, uh, the, uh, in architectural terms, uh, mm -hmm. the local architecture firms, uh, I think, have sometimes had kind of a hard time recruiting our students. So that's a right. city connection that uh, <laughs> isn't working so well. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is they all have job offers in Paris and New York and San Francisco and Portland. So, mm. you know, it's hard to persuade them to stay in Cincinnati when they've already spent six years here going to school. Mm. Uh, can you see or can you think of plans or ideas for DAP students to stay in Cincinnati? With the yeah, they recruit. They have a recruiting fair and, mm. and uh, they come in. And, uh, work on that, so. Okay. And, uh, and of course, Cincinnati is going to be a way cooler city to be in for your generation, so that's probably helping. Hmm. And do you see uh, more staff, staff students, especially in architecture, staying in here, or at least staying in the state of Ohio or near Cincinnati? Uh, I don't know. I don't have that data. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, how has faculty changed over time? Hmm. How has faculty changed over time? Well, I, again, I can only talk about our discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that uh, gradually there's been an increasing amount of emphasis in hiring faculty and in promoting faculty on research. Okay. It's part of that ramping up of research they talked about. Mm -hmm. So the expectation that a faculty member will have a an area of specialty that is publishable and tenurable, uh, that has increased okay. over the years. Um, and that's, uh, I think from most points of view, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it harder to have generalists on the faculty. However, mm. uh, in other words, people who have kind of a broad overview of the discipline as a whole. Mm -hmm. Instead, you have an expert in computer uh, software and graphics, and you have an expert in, you know, 17th century, uh, you know, churches or something, you know, and you have an expert in this and an expert in that. Mm -hmm. um, and they all also teach in the design studios, most of them. Okay. So uh, that's different mm -hmm. than it was 40 years ago. But probably, probably for the better. Okay. Do you wish there was more of a service element to the students than there was a research element? Service? Yeah, like uh, probably more teaching than researching. Um, do you mean as an emphasis for faculty? Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I don't think I really wish that. I think mm -hmm. the, the main balance uh, for tenure ability is teaching and research. Mm -hmm. And... We have been successful in DAP during most of the, my time there in helping the higher administration understand that in a professional field, especially professional or creative field like art or architecture, mm -hmm. um, research includes uh, doing uh, design work, okay. and even if it's not built. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's a plus. So uh, that, that, that has helped us a lot. 
So no, I don't think that balance, I think as long as there's a balance of teaching and research slash hyphen creative work mm -hmm. together, as long as there's that balance, I think that, you know, that's how it should be. Okay. And service is, is less, typically, mm -hmm. as a criteria. Okay. And um, what was hard uh, at teach, what was hard, or what were certain things that were hard teaching at uh, UC? Specifically at, at UC? Yeah, or, or in your program. Was there any barriers? Uh, well, there were some things in the early days that, that probably just, you know, they don't matter now. I mean, it used to be we had an awful time with instructional technology. Mm -hmm. It was so primitive when I started. Uh, but nowadays, that's, of course, that runs beautifully with, <laughs> with all these smart lecterns and all the rest of that. So uh, that's... Uh, that's out of date now to be concerned about that. Um, what was difficult? Hmm. I don't know, nothing's coming to mind. I guess it was okay. <laughs> so it looks like you had like a, you know, a pretty easy time, you know, teaching and... Well, easy not the word, maybe, right. but, you know, Stable. it was hard work. Yeah. Uh, you know, we all do 60-hour weeks uh, prepping for class. The workloads are heavy mm -hmm. uh, in our college because we have studios. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to, you just, typically you teach a studio class and a lecture class. Mm -hmm. And so the lectures, it's three days a week, you have to prep. The studio is three days a week for five hours at a time. So that's okay. 15 contact hours a week plus your lecture, plus you have to do your research or your design practice. Mm -hmm. So the workloads are, okay, that's my answer. The workloads are hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, is there anything you're, you're most proud of at your time at UC? Yes. Uh, I have about, when I had my retirement uh, party, I made a list of the graduates, the alumni that I had mentored, mm. um, you know, for whom I was the, the main mentor over the years, mm -hmm. both in the MS program and in the MR program. And there were about 75 of them that I was still somewhat in touch with, or knew where they were, mm -hmm. that we could invite to my graduation party. <laughs> I wanted it to be about, I wanted the students there, not just the faculty mm -hmm. and administrators. Uh, <clears throat> so when I realized there were that many, uh, I think that's what I felt proud of. And out of the 75, there may be, you know, 25 or 30 that I really do keep in touch with and, mm -hmm. you know, visit them when I go to New York or wherever they live. Bucharest, Romania, you know, places like that. Oh, wow. uh, it's it's wonderful having this network of people that I now consider to be good friends mm. around the world who tell me, sometimes repeatedly, what a wonderful mentor I was and how much they learned and, you know, how it helped their career and so forth. So no, that's that's cool. the That's the, the best part of it all. I think it's pretty cool that you still keep in touch with your uh, uh, graduate students. My men mentees, yes. <laughs> and are you still working in architecture or are you doing something else outside of it? Um, well, I'm still working in uh, design and public education. Mm -hmm. I'm doing this yeah. uh, UNESCO World Heritage mm -hmm. uh, project. We just finished a little publication. Yeah. And I was helpful in designing that. So. Um, a design work, uh, not so much. I mean, my wife and I, we did our house, so we live in now. And we helped friends when they needed, just informally. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I'm really not interested in doing yeah. anything like practice anymore. Yeah. Are, are your former students still, like, 
like architecture or still designing? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. mm -hmm. um, many of those people, those 25 or 30 that were roughly so that I mentioned are, many of them are in teaching oh, wow. academic positions around the world. Those are, more of those are from the MS art program from the 90s. Mm -hmm. When I taught that, um, and more of the MARC graduates that I mentored, mm -hmm. since then, there more of them are in practice. Okay. So it's kind of a mix. Awesome. Yeah. Another, just one more question. Um, what else would you like to tell me that we ever, that we already haven't talked about in this interview? Well, I had a few topics in mind that I wanted to cover, and I oh, think we ahead. covered them all. Oh. No, we did. Oh, we did? You oh. got them all with your <laughs> excellent questions. Oh, awesome. And so yeah. there's there's nothing really much to talk about, you know. Nothing left. Yeah. Uh, nothing springs to mind. <laughs> all right, then. Well, I think, uh, I think we're done with the interview. I, pre I really do appreciate you taking your time out of your day doing this interview for our okay. class. And, uh... Yeah, I really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.